listening to Overwatch League Daily, your daily source for Overwatch League news, scores, and more. Here's your host, Kicked Tripod. Good morning, Overwatch League fans. This is your Overwatch League Daily episode for February 14th, 2018. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. Welcome to Stage 2 Primer Week. I'm going to have ZP on here. I've got Yiska. We've got Bren coming on the show this week, all to talk about what's going on between Stage 1 and Stage 2. Today, I'm sitting down with ZP. We're going to discuss some of the meta changes and meta shifts he expects to see. But first, we had a bunch of signings go on in Overwatch League that we're going to cover really quickly, and then I'm going to be joined by Yiska Later on, the week, later on in the week to discuss them more in depth. So let's go ahead and take a look at those signings. All right, we are going to go through these signings in more depth later on this week with Yiska, but I did want to let everybody know what has been going on because things have been moving a lot and quickly. So first, the Florida Mayhem, uh, one of two teams who really need some help sign a assistant coach R2D-er or Ryder. I have asked a lot of people on the correct pronunciation who are directly involved with Overwatch League and got two to three different answers. So uh, please don't murder me for that one. He formerly comes from MIG Frost, Kongdu Panthera, Newbie, and Meta Athena. And he's also going to play a pivotal role in communicating with their other two new signings, which is Saya Player, who uh, is a Tracer main, or I guess most known for Tracer. He's been with Meta Athena since Apex Season 2. And the other one is Awesome Guy, who was also with Meta Athena at the time, but only since October. Before that, he was a main tank player for LW Red. So three Meta Athena signings. Uh, So, so far, uh, the Mayhem have picked up two new Korean players, a Korean coach and Zappies who is a flex tank player from Finland. The other team that really needed help with some signings was Shanghai. It was reported earlier this month that the Shanghai Dragons were in the process of signing Gaguri, Fearless, and Edo. Yesterday, these signings became official, as well as a previously unreported uh, unreported signing of Chinese support player Sky. Hopefully, these players will reinvigorate a Shanghai roster that finds themselves in last place and without a win in stage one. We also saw the Dallas Fuel make some roster moves. On February 13th, the Dallas Fuel made it official that they had successfully signed AKM, a a DPS formerly of Rogue, and that they were in the process of signing Rascal from the London Spitfire. It's worth noting that the Fuel will have five DPS players on their roster and quite a bit of hero overlap between them all for stage two if they don't offload any players as well. Last but not least is the LA Gladiators. This one is not confirmed as of 12.37 a.m. MT, but Jacob Wolf of ESPN says that the London Spitfire have negotiated a transfer of Fissure, uh, a main tank for the London Spitfire, to the LA Gladiators. Fissure uh, hasn't seen a whole lot of play. He's only seen play in six maps in stage one, but will likely be a great addition to an LA Gladiators team that finds himself in the bottom half. I sat down with ZP to take our first jump into the uh, stage two primer series, which will be concerning the meta. ZP, thank you again for joining me on another episode. I really appreciate it. We uh, sat down and discussed a little bit about something to talk about. And I I know you're really passionate about this meta conversation that we're about to see going into stage two. Absolutely. Uh, The meta changing is probably one of the most exciting parts about the upcoming stage change in Overwatch League, where for people who aren't familiar with how the stages go is that Even if there's a big game change in the middle of a stage, it will not be implemented at the earliest until the next stage. And of course, uh, with the changes that have come in, particularly to Mercy, there are changes big enough to warrant holding off until stage two. But 
The upside here is that it's going to not only enable more diversity for supports, but I think we're going to see some pretty big shifts to the meta as a whole. So more diversity for supports, is that just because with the big nerfs to Mercy, we're going to see more viability for uh, supports like uh, Moira and Ana and Lucio? Uh, definitely more Moira and Lucio for sure. Uh, when you look at tournaments like the Beat Invitational, people were going out of their way to try Ana here and there. Ana still seems to be sort of the odd uh, grandmother out right now, but who knows? I mean, it's still Hero with a powerful kit. I still think there's definitely situations where Nano Boost is probably a little bit underrated and Bionade as a whole. I mean, you talk about tools, there's certainly moments where a well-timed Bionade can shut down a Moira comp, but just people don't try and run that as a mainstay because it's a lot of risk. Still a decent reward, but the risk kind of outweighs the reward you would get on average. But that could very well change based on what people do with it. Regardless, if you're a support player, you definitely have more options going into the patch that's live on servers now. And if you're a support player in OWL, you have to be excited for the ability to not play Mercy in almost any single circumstance. I think Zebesai just did a backflip out of his chair. <laughs> He's so excited. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk Let's talk broad strokes here for just a moment. You've already kind of said, hey, yeah, supports. Uh, we're going to see some more diversity uh, there. Any other uh, big broad strokes you think we might see? I know a lot of people are looking at and think that Junkrat might be totally out of the meta, I personally think his Those ult is still wrong. really good. They're, they're okay, wrong. Good. Like, let, let, let's just cut you off right there. Great. Wrong. Junkrat still has Riptire. Riptire is still absurd. Yes, people are going to be running Junkrat. Junkrat was run a lot in the Beat Invitational, and even though he does less long-range damage, there's still plenty of situations, especially closed in areas, where Junkrat is very, very good. Also, the part where Junkrat's going to be good, and you were kind of discussing broad strokes, is going to be where things go in terms of teams trying out different strategies, where one of the common things that some teams were experimenting with was the idea of running triple tank more often. Problem is, is that when you run triple tank, you suddenly make heroes like Junkrat more effective because they're going to be hitting more things with Splash. The more things you hit with Splash, the quicker you're going to be getting a Riptire, even with the nerfed Concussive Mind. So... It's kind of weird where Junkrat's in the state where some of the things you might want to try running with Moira is actually going to get shut down. Okay, so I'm glad I'm glad we're on the same page on the Junkrat thing because I got into some fights on Discord this last week. So now I can be like, well, ZP said so. <laughs> uh, well, just tell them he still has Riptire. Nothing changed yeah, with Riptire. Riptire is just... That, that should be enough. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So are there any other heroes that you think we might be seeing a lot of going into this new meta? Maybe maybe ones that we haven't seen before? So I think in general, as I mentioned, uh, you're going to be seeing more from tanks. So it's not that we haven't seen before, but I think teams of... Or if you look at uh, Owl over the last week, teams are more willing to experiment with Roadhog to begin with. I think Roadhog is definitely best friends with Moira, even if you're not running a three tank setup. I, so that's one for sure. And just to officially mention it, of course, support-wise, Moira, Lucio, going to be seeing far, far more of them. Probably going to be seeing a small bit less of Farah. I still think maps that are very good for Farah will continue to be good, but the reward for running a Farah comp is less because bringing in Mercy now does actually carry some downsides, where as before, uh, Mercy was sort of your given, so you always had that extra boost to running a Farah, so... I think Farah pick rates across the board will take a small hit, but not dramatically so, because some teams are still going to want to run her, especially on you know situations like, say, Oasis, where she's really good, or certain control uh, stages where she will almost certainly be run, uh, situations like uh, Night Market on Lijiang. So there's going to be places where you still see Farah brand, and I think it's going to overlap with most of the times you see it here. But if a team doesn't really have a great fair player to begin with, now maybe they go back and consider and they go, eh, running a fair comes with the downside of running a Mercy versus, oh, this is great. It works out perfectly with the Mercy. And I know you've talked about this in the past. You've said that uh, in, in the scrims that you've been watching, you've been watching a lot of uh, uh, phenomenal players and stuff. Farah and Mercy are a package deal. Yes. So they're just... 
they're they're together. So it's not like oh, run far without a mercy. It's like not not a thing. Sometimes uh, we did see teams and the beat invitational try to get away uh, at points with running a Zen with the Pharah, which I actually think has more potential than it's given credit for. But it's a very different style of playing Pharah, where I think the reason why teams would run it and not immediately be ex- as successful is that running Pharah, where you're essentially immune to poke damage unless it's super heavy, is very different than if you're running it with a Zenyatta who his uh, healing throughput is going to be a lot less. And generally speaking, Zen likes passing around his healing a little bit more. So I think the play style with the Zen Farah is doable, but it's out of the norm for what people usually play with it. But I, I don't think the people that, or I don't think the teams that attempted running it are necessarily wrong, but we'll see where it goes. I think there's room to develop. Well, we also, too, we're probably going to be seeing a lot less of some heroes. I think uh, Mercy is a safe one to say that we're probably not going to be seeing the... <laughs> whatever that number actually is, pick rate for Mercy. Uh, But what heroes do you think that we're going to be seeing a lot less of? Well, I mean, the key ones there, you know, we kind of covered it in the past, is that uh, Mercy, uh, yes, Farah, a little bit. The rest, I mean, I feel like it's going to be reasonably evenly balanced. I don't think that the Mercy changes have hit a point where you're going to be seeing way less of uh, most heroes. There, There is the possibility, and I don't think this would be the case. I still think there's plenty of good reasons to run him, especially because of his ability to bop Moira's. But you could make the argument that you would see less McCree. You could make the argument that you might see a little bit less Widow. And the reasoning for that would just be the fact that uh, McCree in particular is a hero that uh, benefited more disproportionately from the extra lives that Mercy would give, where if you were the hard dive onto a McCree uh, in a world without resurrection... There's no easy way from the escape or get back up. He's just stuck holding the long respawn timer. Whereas when Rez was a common factor in gameplay, there was less incentive to hard dive McCree if the Mercy was there and could get a resurrection up with uh, some degree of tank pressure because you're not going to have that kill be permanent. So heroes that can't get away easily are definitely impacted a little bit by the Rez change, but I don't see it being to a degree that you see them dramatically less in the meta you see other heroes come in dramatically more, but it's always hard to tell, right? New metas generally have surprises that pro players miss, analysts miss. It's rare for someone to sort of predict the final path without letting it play out for a while. It's very humble of you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's, uh, so here's, this was an interesting, um, an interesting comment that was made uh, in this past week. And it was, uh, I can't remember where specifically I heard it, but there's an argument me- being made right now that Korean rosters will be able to widen the skill gap between where they are now and the- where the Western teams are with the Mercy nerf. Uh, basically because, and, and, and their um, their justification was that uh, with a Mercy can uh, mend mistakes, right? A resurrection at the end of the day, it basically gives you a second chance in a lot of a lot of ways, and and the the way that you would go about uh, fighting in in a in a mercy v mercy type uh, meta is try to get the other team to make a mistake first and use that res first. But do you agree with the fact that we might see a skill gap uh, begin to create as uh, these mercy nerfs come in? I certainly think that there's a possibility for that to happen. I would lean towards it happening. I will note a few things. One is that OWL has sort of created a melting pot where Western players have sort of been able to benefit from Korean coaching, or, you know, in some cases like the Outlaws, they actually have uh, one of the better Korean coaches out there in Tyrong. Uh, So you sort of have the brain drain where Western players have been learning rapidly from their Korean peers if there was a gap that's been lessening it. But I would say that historically one of the bigger gaps between Western players and Korean players has been in the area of supports, particularly when you look at the flex support role. Now you have a situation where you can actually conceivably run things other than Mercy. I do think that is beneficial to the Korean teams given their strengths, where you look at a player like, say, Ruge Hong, who made a legend for himself being an Ana player, and then you get into this current meta and it's like, oh, Mercy, you, you can't run an Ana. So I think that's definitely a benefit. We'll see if it's uh, perhaps a little bit overblown, but I think it's not bad. And then you also get to the idea of 
well, strategy wise, does the just does res existing benefit Western teams more? And maybe I think it's an interesting theory. One thing that would sort of back that up is that historically, I think Western teams have been better in chaotic situations and less good at actually pre planning. And this has sort of been backed up by my times where I've listened to team comms uh, directly and just the fact that you, when you think teams have a grand plan, a lot of times they don't. And I think historically the Korean teams have been better at initial fight planning. But the Mercy meta, as it were, is a meta where you sort of have a little bit more chaos where you're not losing the fight immediately off of the initial gambit. How you initially engage has a little bit less benefit because you can pull fights back with Resurrection. Not to say that all of that is still not incredibly important. It is, but the idea of a second chance and fighting your way through the chaos historically would favor Western teams a little bit more. However, again, I, I do question how relevant the old historical narratives are now that we are heading into essentially month three of teams being in the Burbank area, having chances to hang out with each other, learn from each other, and sort of having that melting pot that OWL has right now. Do you think that there are any particular teams that maybe met benefit from these uh, meta changes from others? Fuel, mayhem, easy. <laughs> like <laughs> The bottom teams. <laughs> Fuel clearly does not like the Mercy meta. They really, really dislike the Mercy meta. And Zebosai, I, I feel like you could show him a picture of Mercy 10 years from now, and he would just collapse to the floor thinking of bad times playing Mercy. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. yes, yeah, so those two teams come to mind. I'm not sure if there's any team out there that necessarily is at a huge disadvantage from Mercy being changed. Uh, we'll have to see where the various flex support skills are, because if you think about it for some of these players, it's been a while since we've seen them doing anything but Mercy, but it would be ill to assume that they haven't been keeping up their skills on other heroes, especially, again, given the sort of melting pot training grounds that OWL has been. So I'm going to reserve judgment on saying, oh, this player's just going to fall off. I'm more sure. willing to give people credit for, like, your Ruge Hongs in the world for saying this player now has more opportunity to flex what he's been known to be good on. But yeah. I do think there's a possibility that some teams actually take a negative downturn after the change but we'll just have to see where the flex supports stand uh, after the change has occurred i think it's too hard to predict right now so uh, let's let's leave on a big question here the the thing everyone wants to know we we just went through five weeks of the same meta on the same uh nine maps i think technically uh, uh there do you think that we are going to see a better healthier competitive environment in stage two than we saw in stage one. Yes. And two reasons for that. One is that I don't think Mercy in her current form was really good for the meta, which apparently is a controversial statement. There are some people that'll go out there and say, I liked Mercy and I do get the thread of logic going to it, but no, I, I still disagree. <laughs> but more so than that is that it's not just the fact that the meta has changed. It's that the meta is fresh which means that it's not entirely figured out yet, which means that you're going to be seeing a lot more variation between teams as teams sort of go through the gyrations to figure out, well, what is the best thing to play in this meta? And it's unlikely to be figured out in full by week one of stage two. So given the fact that you have the meta shift in progress, I think that it opens a door to having some very entertaining matches as people go, whoa, you can run that. That's actually effective. We didn't think this would be effective in this meta. And we get to sort of go along the entire process of seeing the meta settle before our eyes, which is always a fun thing in games, up until the point where the meta gets stale and you go, please change it once more. <laughs> and then in four months, people are like, remember when Mercy was so good and we got to see Junker Town all the time? And you're like, you don't remember anything from the past, oh, do you? You bring up, a, inadvertently there, you bring up a good point, is that Mercy being nerfed is certainly going to hurt the viability of pirate ship comps uh, on Junker Town, where a big part of that was just the ability to bring up, say, the Bastion if it was taken down early on. No easily available resurrection, no crazy powerful Valkyrie. Probably turns Junker Town into a different map for a lot of teams. So yeah. I, I don't think Junker Town is in the pool for Stage 2. I could be wrong. But when Junker Town inevitably makes its return, if Mercy is still sort of on the bench and more niche... Uh, you know, maybe you will 
see a different Junkertown meta and you won't uh, be going, oh, here comes the pirate ship uh, over and over again. Right. Yeah, that did get a little boring. Okay, I lied. I have one more question um, that I just kind of thought of, and it has to do with with these nerfs and how the we'll just say balance changes with how they line up with the stage and how quickly they are brought out. Do you think that Overwatch League needs to uh, address differently when and how we see these nerfs, maybe see big changes uh, go between stages, but smaller ones like maybe Junkrat's Concussion Mind you see uh, more quickly, whereas Mercy's Resurrection nerf you see uh, a little bit later? Or are you happy with just this is the stage, this is how it is, there's no variance there minus, of course, any exploits or game-breaking bugs? I'm very happy with how it's set up right now. I would say the only time that a balance change should be made mid-stage is in the absolute most extreme of circumstances where something is just insanely broken to a degree more so than the Old Mercy. Old Mercy was not at the standard for Insanely Broken. Insanely Broken to me would be a hero where, let's say you introduce a new DPS hero or buff a DPS hero, and then you know, let, let's assume Genji gets injected with steroids, right, in a balance patch. And it goes at the beginning of a stage, and then every team fight you're seeing Genji, no matter the team or really the player's skill level, getting four to five kills because he's shooting laser beams out of his eyes. If you have a balance problem that is at that level of severity, I think you make the change mid-stage. If the balance is acceptable, even if not optimal, I think you let it ride until the uh, changing of the stages. That's where I stand on it. Fair enough. Well, ZP, again, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate uh, all the insight and knowledge you can inject into this show. Thank you. My thanks to ZP for stopping by on the show today. Make sure to follow him on Twitter at TempoZP. Tomorrow I'm going to be joined by, I believe, Yiska. We're going to go ahead and discuss the player signings that we discussed at the beginning of the episodes a little bit more in depth and a little bit more about the impact that they'll have on the league themselves. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, iTunes, or your podcast app of choice. So you don't miss future episodes. You can also watch or listen to the show on the front page of Winston's lab.com. You can find links to everything at overwatch league daily.com as well. And of course, if you want to get in touch, go ahead and send me an email at Overwatch League Daily at gmail.com. Thanks again to ZP for joining me. I'll be back tomorrow with Yiska for another episode of Overwatch League Daily.